It's our great pleasure to welcome to our 2022 online trend summit co-founder and chef of Plates London, Kirk Howarth. Kirk joins us today to talk about plant-based fine dining, his uniquely personal medicinal perspective on plant-based, but also his broader approach that balances health, well-being and sustainability, not only for the environment, but also for him and his team and of course much, much more. Thanks for joining us today, Kirk. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual stage. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Great stuff. Well, just before we get into um, uh, the questions, uh, a note to participants, if you're joining today as a Trend Hub subscriber, you can discover more about the topics that are going to be covered in this discussion in the 2324 Food and Drink Trends Framework, and of course, our cuisine and ingredient predictions, all to be found on Trend Hub. So let's get started. I mean, um, obviously, I want to talk about medicinal plant-based and, and plant-based fine dining, but first, a question to kick us off. I mean, prior to opening plates and turning to plant-based fine dining, you've worked with some of the finest chefs uh, in the world. Can you give us a bit of a potted history from you know, initially pursuing a, a career as a chef and, and where and who are some of the people that you've worked with and inspired you? I left school at uh, 15, 16, um, and I was never that uh good at exams and stuff like that so I kind of fell into a kitchen I was pot washing on weekends um I'm lucky enough that my, my father's a chef so I started an apprenticeship at 16 uh, with my father um where it was a three-year apprenticeship and then a one-year scholarship um and then I came to London uh, when I was 20 and I went to work at the square under Phil Howard but I think that was the time where I really realized um like the pressure and the stress of that kind of intense cooking yeah. um, and people that were in there and the environment. I did a year with Phil. I actually spent most of the time in pastry. Uh -huh. I spent okay. eight months of that time in pastry, yeah. which is really good because the classical stuff like puff pastry and souffles and all those sort of things, he is a master at. Um, and then I went to work um, with Shane Osborne at Pied de Terre. Uh -huh. yeah. um, I just kind of wanted a more smaller kitchen that wasn't as busy because at the square, sometimes we're doing 100 covers at lunch, 100 covers at dinner. Wow, yeah, okay. Um, at that level was, like, very hard. Yeah. 200 um, covers you know, a day at three-star level. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, it was Yeah, it was, It was. was a lot. Um, so Pied de Terre was more like 25 at lunch, 35, 40 at dinner. Yeah. Smaller team, only like six of us. Um, Shane was there every single day. Um, a lot of my philosophy are based on are based now on on Shane. A lot of the respect that he had for his team, I try and emulate um, with kind of how I work now. Um, and then I got an opportunity to go and stage at um, the French Laundry, uh, which is a free Michelin star restaurant. Um, so I jumped at the chance of that, um, went and did that, um, found that incredibly eye opening. Um, just the 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 way those kitchens are run in terms of the organization, the cleanliness. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it's like a palace. It, 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 it might, it's, it's literally mind blowing how, how, and the, the level of discipline was just, was just something else that I'd never seen before. You know, I had to get up at 4 a.m. every morning and put up the American flag, um, you know, and if you, if it was five past four, five past four, you'd be the end of the world. And you get so told off, you know, like it was that intense again in terms of like this time, them things have to be done this way, you know, like just the, just the level of, of detail was phenomenal. That was like brum warring, a piece of celery, they'd get a ruler out and measure each piece. Wow. And if each, and then they'd just throw away all the pieces that weren't the same. And then you'd end up with like half the amount that you had and you'd have to do it all again. And all these like a lot of mental challenges. There was no real shouting there. But it was about, um, it was very mentally challenging and they test you. And then um, I went to Australia. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and I worked at um, two amazing restaurants. One was called Mark, which is closed now, but it was under Mark Best. Uh -huh. um, and um, Passy Petanan, which a lot of people don't talk about Passy, but he was kind of the creative genius and made a lot of the stuff happen behind Mark. Um, but then I worked at Key. So I did yeah. um, three years, uh, three years with Mark, and I did eighteen months at Key under Peter Gilmore, wow. which which actually was a lot more covers, but there was quite a lot. There was a big team, 
and there was a lot of structure and organization and even back then they were doing four days on three days off really? which was you know yeah. you're talking like eight years ago so um and i learned loads about asian cuisine there and but it was kind of that level it's like we don't care about the money it has to be the best yeah. and still um, an institution isn't it even now yeah it is um so I learned, I learned a lot there um and then i came back which has started a lot of which we'll probably talk about later on, but I started a lot of health stuff during that time at Key, which I was pretty ill for kind of like the last year of that. So then I came home um, and it was actually, um, I saw a thing of Sat Baines was doing like four on three off. Um, then so I thought, oh, maybe with my health, I can manage that. Um, so I went to Sats, um, which again was amazing. Well, loads creative, creatively is probably the most open platform place that I've worked the way you can just he just allows you to create anything you yeah, want okay. and if even if it's crap like it's fine just try again sort yeah, of mentality yeah. and discipline of cleanliness and all them sort of things um but I quickly realized I was struggling really bad with my health then and so I had to leave after eight months um and that's when I kind of um had to come back home live with my parents and kind of focus on my healing journey well, let's talk, let's talk a, a little bit about that, um, and we'll come back to I think what plates is. But I, I think I, when you and I first met, I think one of the things that intrigued me and inspired me most about how was about how you got to where you've got to, how you got into plant based, and your sort of personal journey, and and that medicinal angle on um plant-based cooking how, how did it come about yeah when, when i got diagnosed um with lyme disease um after many many years of trying to find out what it was which was very you know traumatic if i'm being honest you know yeah. four or five years of not knowing what it was um and to kind of just waiting around and taking lots of medication uh-huh. um i started to do i started to do a lot of research myself and i think that is the great thing if, if you can do it you know, if you can be very open minded and not yeah. just, you know, because there's so many ways, you know, you can research. And the way I look at things is that I know nothing and I don't believe anything until I really, really have read lots about it and got enough sources to really back that up yeah. in, in many ways. Um, but I started to read about the gut. And this was after I had an intolerance, I had an intolerance test through bioresonance, which is a frequency rife testing. So they take your blood and they can tell from that blood what like intolerances you've got uh-huh. i remember like and as a chef that like loves food i'd eaten everything i, I just yeah. loved everything and i was literally intolerant to everything at that time because my wow. body was so inflamed i think there was yeah. only like uh lamb i think was like one of the only things i wasn't intolerant to and i started to just make soups with coconut oil and avocado oils and all these different oils and luckily obviously my dad's a chef and i was living with my dad at the time I was like, Dad, try this soup or try this cabbage that I've just cooked in coconut oil or try these yeah. carrots. It, like, they're delicious, but just in a different way. Just by doing it, um, I was like eating like 85% plant-based. I was eating like a piece of salmon a week and a little bit of chicken and stuff like that. Yeah, so I did a, I did a lot of things, not just food. I saw a lot of naturopaths. I did a lot of medicine. I did a lot of healing with myself, you know, yeah. a lot of stuff, like a lot of rest and a lot of, you know, like nine years ago, a lot of yoga and a lot of meditation. You have to do a lot of things. You can't just do one thing. Um, and I got I got about uh, 70, 80% better. And a lot of my symptoms started to kind of ease and I was able to come off a lot of my medication. In the light, in kind of the chronic illness Lyme community, a lot of people, I'm not judging, but, it's all like quite doom and gloom and everyone's just like, I'm so sick and trying to find ways to heal. And I wanted to kind of silently show my pain, but through food, which a lot of people don't know that's what, that's what I'm doing, but that's kind of what I'm doing. It's a message in a silent way that through a lot of challenges. And I find that pump base is so challenging that it kind of merges the challenges that I've had together with the food to then create something. Wow. I mean, how do you describe then what plates is um what it's what it's trying to do then? It's a restaurant and food food studio. So and then when I started when we started plates, me and my sister, I was still pretty sick. Um, but I knew I needed to I needed I needed something positive to be able to work on and, and I, I was so disciplined, I let everything else go. I was partying with my friends. You know, I used to love running. I had to start running. I had to just stop everything that I loved 
Yeah. And I just refused to stop. I refused to stop cooking because I knew how good it was for my mental health. And my sister is a lot of the brainchild behind plates and okay. she's very creative. And she came up with um, a concept of having a food studio half the week and having a restaurant half the week. And that's how we started plates because I, I wasn't well enough to do, you know, 10 services a week, lunch yeah. and dinner. I just wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't be able to do it. So yeah. could we create something that is um, sustainable for health? I'm trying to showcase a genre of food that de de deserves the same respect as every other food, but that doesn't need a label of the way of eating. Do, do you have a, a, and it's a bit of a grand term, and I'm you know, not trying to over-intellectualise it, but do you have a, a kind of a philosophy or an approach when it comes to food? You know, you talked about some of the people that you've worked with before that have those those kind of philosophies what should, what would your kind of interpretation of that be chefs have kind of it has been very ego and it has been very macho and it has been very hierarchy and it has been very you know i i'll be honest i used to go to work as a, you know when i was 20 in london i used to be scared to go to work um so i always learn from all that and i do the opposite don't get me wrong i take some some of the good things i saw but I want someone to come to work and feel so warm and feel so content and feel so happy. And I want them to be able to be honest if they're not happy. And, you know, I try and do, we do monthly um, sit downs with the people that work with me. And I ask them, honestly, are you okay? Is there anything that I can help you with? Or, I, I, is there anything that I need to do better yeah. as a person? Because um, I'm not perfect and I'm continue, continually learning. And, um, but I think just to create an environment that's creative, exciting and healthy, yeah. healthy for our minds and our bodies. Because like I say, food can be therapeutic, can yeah. be. We have to create that environment. Yeah. We cannot create that environment with aggression or with, you know, bullying or with any of these things that, that have happened in kitchens before. You're trying to create um, balance and well-being for or an environment that fosters mm -hmm. uh, well-being um, a balance for the diner but also your team and sustainability and throw in you know taste and right. experience yeah. and creativity as well I mean yeah <laughs> how do you do that <laughs> so it's about having a balance that yeah that's the people that work for you know like the long-term goals I always try and drill that into them that this you know where we are now is temporary but where we're going to be is a lot bigger. Um, so whether that's, you know, like as, you know, in their growth with me um, and then, and them sort of things, how do you manage it? Yeah. It's, it, it's tricky. And, and, you know, I, I, cause I'm so passionate about it. And sometimes I can be so passionate about making sure they're okay. Then I'm like, Oh, I forgot about me again. Yeah. You know? So it, it um, you know, like we said on the call before, I think balance of lifestyle is the hardest thing to master. If you, if you get the, get the people bit right like-minded people treated in the right way and then you overlay the i don't know the sustainability piece and the sourcing over the top and then the, the, the kind of the creativity sits on top of that is, do you know what i mean is it is it's kind of siloed or is it you know layered up do you know what i mean yeah i think we're missing a valuable piece that sustainability starts with us and it starts yeah. with our health yeah. You know, like, uh, I think it can cause so much anxiety where people are doing so much for the planet. But how are you? Uh, what are you eating? How do you feel? How's your mental health? Yeah. Uh, because if you're not strong, then how can you help the planet and do all these other amazing things that you want to do? Um, so that's kind of sustainability is health for me. Yeah. And yeah. then the rest will just naturally will just naturally flow. And if you're looking after yourself more, then you're going to be generally more happier. And I think, you know, going back to like, for instance, chefs that are, um, you know, that do get angry with people, or whatever, that's generally their issue. It's generally them that are in pain. Yeah. If you, if you need to treat someone else like that, then yeah, you're not you're not in a good place. Right. Yeah. It's not it's not the person's fault. Yeah, the chefs make mistakes and you know, I have it even now and you know, but it's how do you react to that? Yeah. And it determines where you where you're at in your kind of place in life. And if you're getting angry and throwing things around and stuff like that, then you it's actually need to look at yourself, yeah. not the the mistake that's been done by that chef. Yeah. Um, I know that you're always searching, always testing, always trying new things, and 
you know, talking about the, um, the classical foundation, but having to, you know, you said that you don't use so much of that now. You must have made some really exciting discoveries on the kind of plant-based, you know, fine plant-based dining or medicinal plant-based dining. What are some of those ingredient or process discoveries that you've made and gone, wow, <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. And I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't gone on this journey. Just like the realisation that um, we misunderstand vegetables. Uh -huh. And if we understand them, then we can really then create magic. Like, like a mushroom sauce, for instance, if you said that to most chefs, the first thing they'll do, they'll put butter and cream in it. Yeah, yeah. You make a sauce without it. You make a really intense mushroom stock, you put Madeira in there and lots of shallots it's the most delicious thing ever and it's more pure i guarantee you than the one that's laced with butter yeah and you can make it as silky but you just got to give it a bit more attention yeah um so i think applying a lot more attention to each ingredient is 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 one of the amazing things that i think you have to do uh, but in terms of ingredients like now we've got lion's mane mushroom on the menu which is incredible which is really cool because it's so good for us so good for our you know con uh can't even say that word it's so good for our brain con cognitive function that's <laughs> it um and our immune system and all these things um when i push ideas too much and like get frustrated about them and they don't they're never actually the best dishes the dishes that kind of just flow and come naturally yeah. Um, and I think some some of the odd dishes, you know, like the first dish that ever that ever was like, OK, I can definitely create something with this on this level was um, and I'm, I'm actually doing it today. And it's going on the menu this week. It's black and slayer lasagna with um, like a creamy mushroom sauce on the bottom. And then we put um, like hazelnut cream, miso, toasted hazelnuts and like pickled fungi on the top. Wow. Um, and that was really the first dish that I was like okay i can create something restaurant worthy here with this yeah um and then i yeah i, I love going i also going back and then sitting with it and going right how can i make you better ask, ask yourself look at that thing and say how can we make it better yeah and even if you try and it's no good you can actually create a new idea yeah there's there's so many things i think i breaking through with ice creams without yeah. dairy and eggs is, is game changer absolutely well if I you hadn't you... mentioned ice cream i was gonna, i was going to mention the ice cream <laughs> yeah I I guys just... ice cream <laughs> um yeah that 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 definitely was a game changer that opened up a lot of avenues for desserts definitely yeah. Yeah. um yeah so that the, there's yeah a gluten-free bread yeah. was definitely a game changer yeah. Because yeah. gluten free bread when I when I was gluten free was just like ugh, so heavy. Yeah. Um so again, like we don't say the bread's gluten free, we don't tell anyone. No. But it is. So yeah, like things like that. Um and it, but they don't know that it's because of like I went gluten free and then went on this mission to try and make gluten free bread delicious. Um, we just give it to them. Yeah. Are there any other uh, food food groups? I mean, you touched there on there that the fact that the bread is gluten-free that's obviously not a prerequisite of being you know having a plant-based um, or no. you know, vegetable-based diet so well why why do that but also are there other food groups that you say well, actually i either eliminate that or i try to use as little of that as possible within your overall ingredient mix i wouldn't say there's anything that i dislike i just i'm more intrigued if it's got more health value you yeah. know so looking at things that not everyone just uses so trying to look at some things that are a little bit different a little bit more exciting than just kind of you know the normal stuff or if you are going to get a carrot for instance like how how can you get the best carrot uh, making sure it's organic and then how can you cook it in a way that is a bit different yeah what are your go-to autumn ingredients oh god artichokes celeriacs beetroots cabbages mushrooms yeah. all of them there's so many <laughs> yeah um cause i think food's a feeling isn't it it's such yeah. a feeling like as a chef you have to feel and as a diner you you know you it, food really connects with you and it's a feeling yeah. um um there's like a cured beetroot dish we do with like pine and hibiscus which is really i love which is really lovely yeah um um 
Yeah, I love like all the soups as well in winter, like the broths, like hot broths in winter, like one of my favorite things. Um, that that's super cool. And the dish, I think the dish, the main course we've got at the moment is probably the best main course I've ever done, which is which is um a calibos cabbage which we brine in hibiscus tea and then we glaze it with like plums and berries like a really deep sauce and then we barbecue it um then we serve it with um sweet and sour like sticky plums um like we barbecue lion's mane mushroom um now i serve it with some beef steak mushroom as well which is amazing just amazing which i got one on the weekend you probably saw um and then we serve and then like some cauliflower cream just for the creaminess. And then we make a, a one of the breakthroughs and make a red wine sauce, but just with lots of vegetables. And it is the most rich, delicious thing ever. I will, I literally, this might sound too confident, but I'll challenge any meat chef that cooks with <laughs> stocks against my vegetable start, uh, sauce. I'm up for the challenge if anyone wants it. <laughs> it's, it's, wow. it's that good. It's that good. How has your understanding of the gut biome influenced, you know, what you put together on the plate? Because that sounds like that's, you know, that understanding for you is quite foundational. When we get the the, the next site for plates, that's when I'm going to really delve into the, 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 the health stuff and really kind of master this kind of in the menu style and everything. But obviously where we are now, we, it's a balance because obviously um you know we have to do certain things that yeah. works for their clients as well yeah. um so you know um i don't at the moment i don't go crazy in, into it but yeah some things obviously i, I look at that, that are good for the gut for now it's more about just really progressing the style progressing the food um and also yeah understanding a bit of the gut um but yeah winter's great for that with obviously all the soups and yeah. the clear broths that you yeah. can make and you know whether that's just do you know like i'm gonna um like the lasagna for instance i'm gonna season like each layer um today with like traga powder and turkey tail powder yeah um which are really really good for the gut like turkey tail is incredible I and mean, it's the most powerful mushroom on planet earth so like things like that i'll silently put in there that are really good for them but they won't even know it no no no, no. <laughs> it, it's a balance isn't it because some people like really love to hear your story and inspired by it and some people yeah. just want to eat food yeah and, and have a glass and have a glass of wine yeah um so we're in kind of that middle procedure at the moment in the space that we're at but once we build our own space that will definitely change yeah um, do you find it easier or harder to cook without animal protein? You know, is it freeing or is it restrictive? Not now, no. But <laughs> it, it, in general, it is harder, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, plant-based eating now is well beyond a, a trend. It's a it's a food genre. Where do you see yeah. plant-based fine dining in its evolution? It's never ending. Um I think this, we can take it to places that can blow people's minds yeah. because people have such a, a such a narrow perspective of the capabilities of just vegetables, right? Yeah. Because that's kind of what we've been, society's kind of programmed that through us, through what we should eat, right? Yeah. Diet and all those things. Um, so I think it's it's never ending. I think I find it like, um, it's like a jigsaw puzzle and we're only just putting 2% of the pieces yeah. together yeah um, which is super exciting it's super exciting to be in this space sometimes when i get frustrated and i can't think of dishes or whatever i'm like oh i've done this to myself kirk why don't i just cook everything like <laughs> everyone else um but it is super exciting to to be in this space because it challenges you mentally and i think that is good for your mental health as well well how do you how do you see well i suppose there's two parts to this question diner's perception how is that changing and evolving when it comes to plant-based or sort of finer plant-based but also the industry's perceptions as well yeah i think i mean industry perceptions definitely definitely make it a little change i mean i've had some chefs come and eat that i didn't think would come and eat you know they're always putting caviar up and you know big pieces of fish <laughs> and meat and stuff and then, like, James Nappit, he came, he messaged me on Instagram. He's like, Kirk, I, I just love what you're doing. Can I? Can you book me a table? And I'm like, oh, really? Wow, okay. Yeah. Like, thank you so much. Because um, it, it does lend, you know, 
it needs a bit of open mindedness to come out come out and just yeah. come for a plant based meal, right? And if you're a chef that eats everything, you're probably ninety nine percent of the time you're going to choose somewhere else that cooks everything, whether that's you know like the library or whatever, where they cook delicious meat and fish and everything else, which I understand. Yeah. So yeah. we have got a lot of work to do to persuade those people, but um, if you can, yeah, that that's again like one of my secret jobs to like make make the food not look vegan, yeah, so it doesn't yeah. put people off and it's yeah. not preachy. It's just it's just intriguing to people. Like, oh, actually, I actually just want to try that, yeah, because I mean, because I'm actually interested. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a massive fan of just eating veg, but I'm really interested about what flavor combinations he's doing. Yeah. So then, then that kind of snowballs and stuff. Um, so yeah, I think um, there is shifts, but I think we've got a long way to go. Yeah, and is that the same for diners as well? Is that a, do you find you know are they embracing it more than perhaps you know they have before? Yeah, I think I've never had a pro- I, luckily, and I think because I try and make the food, like I say, quite humble, and um, it's got some. I try and make sure it doesn't feel like it's another way of eating sort of thing yeah. that um everybody i know yeah no one ever comes and like no one's ever said to me anyway um <laughs> like you have like 70 percent of people that come on even vegan no so i think that answers that question yeah, in, it does, in yeah. itself absolutely um that, that no i think yeah it's it's for everybody i've always said that it's for everybody yeah it's you know? Where, where do you because this is quite well it is emergent particularly your your particular angle on it so where do you i think i probably know the answer to this but i'm going to ask anyway where do you look for that inspiration for those you know for that next dish what feeds that yeah you know what i look i look um deep within myself for it yeah i don't look at cookbook i don't look at cookbooks anymore um when, I, when you're younger, you're, yeah, you always look at cookbooks and you do an idea like that. I don't know, it never feels like it's yours. Yeah. Um, and, you, and as you kind of grow, you you find different ways of doing that, of like um, creating, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of look within myself um, for ideas. Um, but also I ask, you know, people that work for me to, you know, like I said on Saturday, I was like, right, you, you and you, you've got five minutes, write down five things that work with beetroot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, because we had um, a Polish guy in, we had an Indian lady, and then we had an English guy and a Nigerian. Our pot washer is Nigerian, yeah. and he's an absolute legend. And you don't have to be a chef. You don't have to have 20 years' experience in right. Michelin Star Kitchen. Like, you might have just travelled somewhere, and you've got this, like, really cool ingredient or idea that can just yeah. bring something to the table. So I always ask. I think it's good to um, um, ask other people as well. Um but yeah, whether that's just research an ingredient that I'm passionate about, I'm like, right, how can I make this, uh, let's say, moringa taste good because it yeah. tastes like shit? Yeah. How can we? How can, <laughs> excuse my language. How can we make it taste good? And yeah. then that's a challenge that you give yourself, right? I've got to ask you, what does the future look like for for you and your sister and plates? What's what kind of comes next? Yeah, so in the mo- at the moment we're just um, we're just in big kind of talks with getting the right investment <laughs> investment, which will then be able to give us the uh, funds to build our own dream space, uh, which has always been my dream. Yeah. Um, and then the goal is to make that the best thing in the world, and I think you've got to dream big, otherwise yeah. you, yeah. And I think I've done a lot of work on me on myself mentally, which is always quite. You know, and I'm very open about this. I think a lot of people are like, you know, we don't, we don't say, we don't say out loud what we want to be, yeah. um, for the fear of like being too cocky or confident or whatever. And like it's, you know, I used to talk, you know, bad about myself and say, oh, I'm not good enough for this, or no, I'm, you know, I'd be scared to say what I want to do, and now I just say what I want. Yeah. And if if I don't get there, fine, but at least I tried. Yeah, just to try and be the try and be the best create a healthy environment and be happy and yeah. not chase money but you know and just yeah just keep working on stuff and flowing with the waves the ups and the downs and learning from from those failures and those mistakes that we all make in life every single week you know we all make mistakes but what can we learn from them and how can we use that to then grow and be better mentally and physically um 
so yeah, that's the goal, just to keep growing plates to be recognised and to be understood. Yeah. Um, for what it, for what it really is. And what would your because I think you are you are you do challenge norms um with your with your food and your vegetable cookery. So what would you what would you like your legacy on the industry and the food scene to be, do you think? <laughs> um talking about yeah, dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think uh, you know to be, and again, same when I was younger, I used to always be bothered like what people thought about me and all these things. Now I'm I'm not I'm so content like with the self myself and the people I around me. It's not, you know, like of course, like, you know, you you want if you're putting so much work into stuff, of course not you know, you'd be lying if you say you don't want to be recognized and you don't want to be respected in the industry. Of course I do. Um, but I can't I can't force that. If people want to uh, recognize me, then cool. If they don't, then cool. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just think to be appreciated for the work that I do is yeah. is all is all I think. Yeah. To make people think, help people to think differently about plants yeah, and vegetables I mean, and their diet, I guess as well. Yeah, and just inspire people. Well, that's the younger ones and stuff, you know, and try and help them. You know, I'm really passionate about teaching people and um and and i think we need to really nurture the younger ones yeah. and there'll be a lot more younger ones now that just want to cook pan base so hopefully i'll give yeah. them an option to come and work in a kitchen that is you know give them give them that option yeah if you think about it you know you know obviously there's been loads of vegetarians for many many, many years and, yeah. and probably lots of chefs that have actually come out of cooking because they couldn't find a kitchen that they yeah. just wanted to cook veg but they, they didn't find a kitchen that they could really you know yeah. grow in and fit in so hopefully for the future i create you know a space for the younger ones if they just want to cook veggie food yeah what does um what does your dad think when he comes to eat your food <laughs> yeah no, my dad's uh, uh yeah i mean me and my sister talking about this yesterday my dad's like super hard and he doesn't he doesn't really ever say anything to us like oh, i'm really proud of you or anything never um it's just that generational thing, I think. Um, but yeah, apparently saying to my sister that he's super proud of of what we've done and yeah, yeah the food that I do. It's, it's so different and things like that. Um, so yeah, that, that was actually a big, a big. Um, what, what's the word like? Tire to let loose. That yeah, it's a weird thing when your father's a chef and people don't understand this. People think I had it when I was younger, like oh. You know, like you think that you you get given a lot of stuff and you just yeah. get in the kitchen because of your dad and all this, and it's so wrong. It's yeah. so the opposite. Um, but yeah, not I used to always like just want to make my dad so proud, and I was yeah. actually losing myself, like yeah, like, uh, but not even bothering what I what I was doing, what I was thinking about. I was like, you know, I want to make my dad so proud. I want to make sure he, you know, and it, and it, and it was a wrong kind of yeah path to go down. It's about now. I just again stay in my own lane and just try and as long as i'm proud of what i'm doing then that's all that matters yeah kirk a huge thank you from team no, bsp and the 2022 summit audience for sharing your expertise your knowledge your journey uh hugely inspiring and thought-provoking your perspective on plant-based cooking plant-based fine dining and the medicinal angle to that as well we really appreciate you sharing uh, sharing your journey with us. It's, uh, it's been great to have you as part of the summit lineup. Thank you. Always, thank you for allowing me to uh, yeah to be here today. It was our pleasure.